Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Assalamualaikum and uh, uh, good morning to participants, uh, local and abroad, right? Uh, Friday uh, morning. So today we will begin our session on the uh, green, inno uh, green innovation for sustainable uh, tomorrow. And uh, our speaker will, will not be us for the live Q&A, right? So we will now uh, proceed to the uh, uh, recorded uh, session. So uh, I will uh, welcome uh, abroad on the uh, presenters. Yes. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the presentation by Encik Muhammad Fauzi Ismail, Director of Industrial Centre of Innovation for Energy Management. Please welcome Encik Muhammad Fauzi. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mimi. You're welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning to all the participants today. My name is Ahmad Fauzi bin Ismail. So I'm the director of Industrial Center of Innovation in Energy Management, City Industrial Research. It gives me a great pleasure basically to be with you today in this webinar session to share my thoughts, to share projects that we did for industry, how we can be of assistance to you in terms of managing your energy better in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, energy has been the driver for economic and social development. With energy, the nation can power up factories, production facilities, businesses, building schools, hospitals, and houses. Practically, Every aspect of our life revolves around technology that requires energy and power. Since the industrial age, the world has been over reliance on fossil fuel to drive industrialization. Today, Malaysia generates electricity primarily from burnings of fossil fuel to supply power through our national grids. And this account for nearly 80% of the total carbon emission in Malaysia. The other major sector that contributes to CO2 emission is the transportation itself, something that we cannot ignore. To address global warming and climate change, Malaysia has committed to reduce 45% of GSG emission intensity of GDP by 2030 based on COP21 Paris Agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, these are two graphs, similar graphs, the ones on the left. The graphs on final energy consumption taken for the National Energy Balance Report 2018. The ones on the top, okay. Is the final energy consumption by sector, okay? by sector. The one at the bottom is final energy consumption by fuel type, okay? If you can see on the top there, the industrial sector account for nearly 30% of the final energy consumption. The second largest sector after the transportation, the one indicated in red, okay? The blue ones refers to the industry. Okay? If you look at the bottom one, in that electricity accounts for 20% of the total energy consumption by fuel type, meaning that the other 80% basically come from fossil fuel in the forms of natural gas or other petroleum products, diesel, things like that. Okay? Given that 
50% of the total electricity generation is utilized by the industrial sector, we come to a conclusion, we come to a conclusion that electricity accounts for one third of the final energy consumption by the industrial sector. And the remaining two thirds basically come from fuel, fossil fuel. It is important to understand that these two thirds in the forms of fossil fuels are basically relates to industrial process heating. Fuel used to generate heat for various industrial process. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not sustainable in the long run. And industry players has to look for option basically to decarbon, to decouple our discarbon and moves towards a green economy. Ladies and gentlemen, at the Industrial Centers of Innovation in Energy Management, we offer comprehensive energy solution that enable industry players to progressively decouple fossil fuel into green energy. This will in turn save your energy bill and contributes to CO2 emission reduction and promotes green economy. Ladies and gentlemen, our initial engagement, the one written there, number one, our initial engagement with industry begin with comprehensive energy audit exercise. This is a very important step to be undertaken right from the beginning. At this point, our technical team will do energy measurement and analysis for a period at least seven days. This where we lock our power analyzer and main supply board at sub-supply board and specific equipment to monitor energy demand and profile throughout the week. We also do assessments of thermal energy supply. Okay, first one we talk about electricity. Now we say we also do assessments of thermal energy supply, such as boiler, heating elements, and look for process optimization. The results we can identify significant energy users and energy apportionment and losses based on major equipment and facilities. And then we propose energy saving measure. Ladies and gentlemen, normally after energy audit, two new technology solution, two new technology solution will be proposed to improve demand side management. Number one is solar industrial process heat. Solar industrial process heat that will address the thermal energy requirement. Secondly, solar PV energy storage and intelligent energy management to address the electricity part of the factory. So our technical team will assess the demand for electricity and thermal energy, undertake design works and propose a solution basically that suits your factory conditions and budget. This is our first job to carry out energy audit. Okay, this is a typical energy data taken one of the energy audit project recently. This is a weekly electricity demand and profiles of the plant operation. Okay, the pie chart describes electricity apportionment by major facilities and processes in this particular factory, consortium pickers in the Bahad. It is important for us to prioritize energy saving measure that brings about maximum impact to the company. Similarly, when applying thermal energy supply, for instance, from a boiler, we are certain energy losses during combustion, energy losses during conveyance of steam, and final losses in the final process, in this case, drying of wood, and at the return condensate. Thus, the effective thermal energy demand at the process level can be satisfied. This is very important the moment we want to integrate solar energy solution into the process.
Ladies and gentlemen, let us understand process heat demand of various subsectors. This analysis is taken for the National Energy Balance Report in 2016. The figure very much the same as what we are looking at, you know, from year to year, even until today. The trends almost quite the same. These are the main industrial subsector that contributes to a high energy consumption within the industry. The bars on the left there indicates the types of fuel used by different subsector. The yellow refers to electricity, while the brown and the orange basically are those petroleum-based fuel. And normally they are used for process heating. Okay. In these three subsector, the one I put there, the line there, and moving to the right, that is chart there. These three subsector, chemical, transports and machinery, and food and beverage. We observe high energy consumption for process heating associated with low temperature. When I say low temperature, if you look at the graph on the right hand side, those are, you know, having yellow in color. This is temperature normally 100 degrees and below. Okay. This process, 100 degrees Celsius and below, can easily be met by solar heating. Talking a topic that I want to talk about a bit more later. Okay. For instance, in the food and beverage industry, heat is utilized in many industrial process. Sterilizations, the food is carried out at high temperature to kill all the bad bacteria. Similarly, pasteurization of milk is done at certain temperature below 100 degrees Celsius to maintain its freshness and to ensure free of bad bacteria. Boilings of water in food industry is common. Hot water is used for preparations in cooking and cleaning in general to maintain certain hygiene condition. For instance, in poultry, in poultry processing, hot water is used in scouting process. This is where slaughtered chickens are submerged into hot water for a period of about two minutes to ease the feathering process after that. The question is, can solar process heat meet industrial process heat demand? Yeah? Can solar do the job for the industry players? That's the main question, perhaps. Because perhaps many of you have not seen how solar can meet industrial process heat. You will be surprised to know that solar energy, or solar thermal technology can provide heating from low temperature 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, right up to 450 degrees Celsius. At 450, you can do lots of things, okay? For low temperature heat, we can utilize standard flat collector, okay? For medium temperature heat, we can use evacuated tube collectors. Whereas for high temperature application, we can utilize concentrated solar in the form of parabolic trough, or Fresnel collectors. The real challenge is how to do this integration into your existing energy supply system in your factory, in the industry. Based on our study, these are potential industrial subsector to benefit from solar process heat because of their temperature requirement. Food and beverage, pulps and paper, rubber glove, hotels, and hospital. When we undertake this solar thermal project, you know, we started with these simple steps, okay? Identifying energy demand, that's very important. By doing this mass energy balance, we do some measurement aside, we do some calculation based on certain energy principle. After that, we design hot water storage capacity according to the energy demand at that particular process. Later, we design proper heat exchanger to ensure 
optimum heat transfer. So we ensure that we get the right temperature at the process required in the industry. And finally, we determine solar collector area needed to meet the energy demand. Okay, and this is all done using software called TSOL. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is indeed the first industrial scale solar thermal plant installed in the country the first one in the country for poultry processing plant it serves as a demo plant to exhibit how the technology works and also serves as a platform for sharing of knowledge and disseminations of information to industries and public like what i'm doing today The project won National Energy Award in 2018, and also won ASEAN first runner-up under off-grid thermal category. I said earlier, this is the first project at the industrial scale taken by city. Yeah. We don't stop there. We continue to do more and more projects for industry to prove and demonstrate how the system can be applied at various industry. For instance, this is another example, a project by seeding for FMB. The process here is required for food preparation. The company managed to reduce LPG consumption when partial heat is supplied by solar heating. Okay. This is another project, another successful project when we utilize heat for Stabilization of beverage, okay? I say sterilization doesn't require high temperature. So instead of getting the heat from the steam generated by electricity, we propose solar solution, which is indeed much more cost effective and greener, okay? This is another example, company utilizing solar hot water for beverage preparation. Yeah, Puan Farah. We share a bit more later on in the sharing session how this technology helped them, you know, to save energy and to grow her businesses. Okay. Some hot water used in food preparation, however, in the case of this particular company, Ever Delicious, a company that makes cookies and biscuits. The company utilizes hot water for cleaning some more. You know, in this kind of factory, you keep, you know, changing more from one to another. And you when you are in the biscuits industry, all your more you basically end up with all these margarines and butter, and it's not easy to clean them. So hot water provides a perfect solution. Okay. In the past, the company relies on all this LPG gas to provide hot water for cleaning purposes, but nowadays. Nowadays, 100% of hot water coming from solar. So another successful project. After the first success in the poultry processing plant, we also managed to complete another large scale project in Johor. Supplies hot water for scouting process, I say, for chicken processing. The collector's area stands at 500. 500 square meter and it's all on the rooftop there, okay? And it's got the thermal storage tank that can make up to 25,000 liters or 25 cubic meters at 85 degrees Celsius. So this system ensure supplies of enough supplies of hot water for scouting process throughout the day. So this is where the company safe from previously used diesel and electricity for heating of water, but now the system, you know, is partially replaced with solar heating. There is a gentleman when we share you just now projects that we taken by seeding. Those are the first in the country. However, I want to alert you that in Europe, in Europe in particular, where solar irradiation is much, much lower compared to Malaysia, we have seen many of these plants before very start of industry. Here I show you some of the electrochemical cleaning plant that we see in Switzerland. Okay, utilizing solar thermal for 
heating of chemical bath. I'm also sharing here some international projects where solar heating being used in meat processing plant in, in Austria. I've been to this plant. Gatorade in USA, beverage company, and also solar cooling. This is another application other than the industry for commercial building, okay, in this United World College and also in this CGD Lisbon. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the second energy solution to embark when we talk about this, you know, electricity is energy is to basically embark on this solar energy, energy storage, and IoT system to achieve smart energy management, okay? This is in the era of digitalization of energy management, okay? When we talk about- Sorry, IG uh, the time is up already. Maybe we can give you another three minutes. Yeah, okay, I, I, I'm finishing in maybe less than two minutes, please, okay? All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sorry, thank you for- So, Okay, with the advancements of digitalization in power sector, power grids will be smarter and capable of allowing, allowing bi-directional flows of electricity and information from utility to consumer. Not only that, the grid is coming more and more prepared to accept more renewable energy, including energy storage. Okay, the first project that we did for solar energy is basically this projects under this you know, FIT scheme in the early 2015, 2013, and name one, two, and three, okay? So, and now the next project that we did was basically, we don't just employ solar PV, but now we, what we did was serum intelligent energy management system where we employ solar PV, energy storage, and intelligent energy management, where we can achieve you know, basically saving through reducing maximum demand and peak shaving, okay? And these are some of the projects I highlight very quickly that we did. This is a real project, three different companies, JPC Intan Joho, APS Manja, as well as DD Plastic. Okay, so what's next? What's next is that the next major development and game changer in energy management is people like you and me beginning to appreciate the rules of energy storage. Yeah, this is very important. I, I say, you know, to make it short, this energy storage enable us in two ways, to improve power qualities and reliability. And the second one there, retails energy time shifting. With energy storage, you can, you know, embark on new tariff, for instance, like Etau, where previously without solar PV, without energy storage, you cannot do that because this is, demand respond, and then where you can achieve uh, more cost saving. So uh, any one of you maybe you know, interested to, to, to find out more about the project that we do and how it can help you to save energy and to manage your energy better, you can always contact me. You have my number down there and also my email there for reference. With that, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Encik Muhammad Fauzi, for the uh, informative and interesting presentation. Move on, ladies and gentlemen. Up next, may I now invite Encik Muhammad Nazri Ahmad, Elias Muhammad Sanif, Senior Researcher of Environment Management Section, Environment Technology Research Center, to deliver his presentation. Please, please welcome Encik Muhammad Nazri. Thank you, Puan Mimi. Uh, my name welcome. is Muhammad. Assalamualaikum and selamat sejahtera. My Sada. name is Muhammad Nazri bin Ahmad. I'm a senior researcher from Environmental Technology Research Center, Serum Innovation, Serum Industrial Research uh, Department. Uh, today, I'm uh, very excited to talk about uh, Carbon Footprint, which is uh, one of uh, service that offered by my uh, section, which is uh, environment management to support the industry for business environmental sustainability. Maybe you are familiar with this uh, diagram which is developed by uh, United Nations for sustainable development goals. Here we can see that there are 17 class. Uh, my section, environmental management, 
uh, focus on the on class number class and 13, which is responsible consumption and production, and also climate change by uh, offering a service related to the life cycle assessment of the product or services. Basically, there are two ways in environmental assessment for your product or services. Uh, first, they are life cycle assessment which, uh, based on ISO 14044, 14044, which is a multiple eco impact categories, uh, including the global warming, acidification, ozone depletion, and so on. And the other one is carbon footprint, which is more focused on single impact category. Is referred to global warming potential or climate change. In this uh, process, we refer to ISO 14067 for product and ISO 14064 for organization carbon footprint. And sometimes we also refer to GSD protocol for product organization and community. Uh, there are many benefits uh, if you want to implement the CFP analysis, uh, for example, for carbon combination, uh, let, for example, uh, let's say you have uh, know the value of your uh, CFP of your product, then you can tell your consumer or your client about this value to, to show that uh, your company or your product is concerned about the environment. The second one is to identify the hotspot based on the life cycle of your product or service. And green suppression selection for, for your supplier. And if you are also the supplier of to the other company, then you can use it as a marketing uh, evidence in terms of environmental issue. And then for process improvement, carbon emission, and this one uh, can be done by yourself uh, following the ISO type 2 uh, equilibrium requirement and whatever uh, value and then the calculation procedure you can uh, just prepare the report and uh, provide to the your consumer or your client but for make it the uh, cfp assessment more reliable and uh, and boleh dipercayai you can go to another stage for by third party verification in Serene, we have a product carbon labeling. You can see here the logo. This, uh, this uh, scheme was run under Serene QS. And then if you get this logo, uh, there are several benefits that you can, you can get. And you can use it to apply uh, point scoring in green breeding rating specification. For example, my class, green breeding index, and green RE. And then you can also use this uh, to apply for uh, green, uh, my hijau mark under green tech technology, green MGT Malaysia, green technology Malaysia. And this is a step, uh, normal step in applying the carbon certification, uh, product carbon certification scheme. There are two steps here, measurement and certification and leveling. And the measurement start from the quantification rules. That means, uh, uh, for each product uh, category, you have to refer, if you want to do the calculation of the CFP value, we have to refer uh, to the uh, particular specific standard for that uh, product, product category. For example, like, um, clay, clay roof tile, we have to first develop the requirement or standard for CFP calculation for clay roof tile. Uh, this quantification, quantification rule is based on life cycle assessment from uh, cradle to grade. And then second one is the product data sheet uh, is used to collect the data. And then after data collection, we, we can just uh, do the CFP calculation and, and do, prepare the CFP report. After the CFP report uh, has been prepared, uh, you can pass to the same certification and the same QS for uh, auditing process and labeling. For the product category, product carbon labeling, we, first we have to uh, develop the standard 
that we call product category rules. Uh, so this standard was uh, is developed under same standard, same STS. And then if you want to uh, apply for uh, carbon footprint for your product, first you can uh, refer to this website to check either the product category rules is already established for your product category or not. If not, you can uh, propose a request as in to us to develop the new uh, product category rules for your product category. After uh, we, uh, we get the, we develop the product category rules, and then for the calculation, and there are two calculation, uh, two type of data here. First one is uh, inventory data from your uh, actual or uh, set uh, set inventory data from your process, and the second one is the background data. Um, for the background data, normally uh, we refer to my SID or Malaysia Life Cycle Inventory Database, which is developed uh, in 2010 under RMK9, and then there are more than 170 life cycle inventory data set in, in our database. And this uh, that database is uh, available for public access. And then uh, for the calculation, normally uh, we are using the same carbon calculator which developed by my section, environmental management section. And this uh, carbon calculator is developed based on uh, ISO 14067 requirement and IPCC guidelines to standardize the calculation and emission factor used in the CFP calculation. And then the uh, background data is sourced from, uh, as I said tadi, from my SCID and other commercial SCI database, such as EcoInvent, Gabi, and so on. And we also provide the hotspot analysis to identify the which area or phase that contribute more the or highest in terms of CO2 emission. For example, here you can see that the raw material is the hotspot for this process. And then upon the result of the calculation, we can prepare the report. This is the example of the report for ceramic tiles, and then we can extract the uh, information and result uh, chart from the same carbon calculator to embedded in our report and then we can we can tell the client or the company about which area uh, should be uh, improved in the future besides uh, carbon footprint for the product we also provide GSD uh, accounting and reporting for the corporate level. Uh, for example, uh, if, let's say we want to show to the uh, our uh, masyarakat that we are uh, uh, focus on green. Uh, then we we try to tell the the public that we are in process of reducing the emission factor emission from GSG emission from uh, the operation of our company in particular year, then uh, we can use this uh, corporate and uh, this corporate reporting for GSG emission. The benefit, there are several benefit, for example, for cost saving, because uh, in, as we know, um, related to the GSG emission is uh, related to the uh, fuel consumption and combustion. Then, if you try to reduce the GIG emission, it's also secara uh, tidak langsung akan turut mengurangkan uh, penggunaan uh, bahan bahan api and pembakaran bahan api. And then you also you can use as a combination for uh, as I said earlier for branding of your company in terms of environmental. Uh, and then uh, this uh, current uh, uh, demand from our our public to request the company to do uh, to uh, lebih menumpukan perhatian kepada uh, isu alam sekitar dengan uh, lebih fokus kepada 
pengurangan pembebasan gas uh, GSG. This uh, list of the uh, commercial and project that previous uh, previously that we have done. It started from 2001, uh, early 2000, with Jamai in, in Jetro in Japan. Uh, and then we had established the National Life Cycle Inventory Database in 2006 to 2010, based on RMK9 budget. And we also have a uh, uh, EU Swiss Asia project to develop a carbon footprint scheme uh, in 2002 and 2005. And then there are also a uh, uh, total, total company yang we have uh, engaged uh, to do the commercial project in terms of uh, capacity building, for example, Petronas, UVM, Agenta, Top Glove, Eco.co. And we also provide the consultancy in uh, do the CFP calculation and reporting for MADI, ammonia, uh, dan beberapa uh, syarikat lagi. Dan uh, saja untuk kali ini. And so, kalau if you have any question or uh, to to want to you have a plan to to embark for CFP calculation and reporting for your uh, product or or organization, please contact me or uh, Puan Martina, my session head, uh, dengan mujuk kepada uh, contact number dan email yang tertera. Sekian, terima kasih. Thank you very much, Encik Nazri, for the uh, informative and interesting presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, up next, please allow me to invite PS Azhar Abdurraof. Director of Industrial Center of Innovation for BioNG to deliver his presentation. Please welcome T.S. Azhar. Thank you, Madam Mimi, for your kind introductions. And so welcome. thank you for organizer for giving me the opportunity to uh, present at this uh, webinar. Okay, uh, just now we heard about this energy management and also about the uh, special risk management. So the cost saving can be can be done through energy management also from a, a special risk management. And also the other option is uh, through technology intervention where uh, through the, the, the right technology application such as uh, heavy metal recovery from uh, wastewater treatment plant. So the wastewater treatment plant normally uh, the, the most difficult, uh, the most unprofit, I mean, it didn't gender income. It consume, uh, it consume a lot of money. So we need to have a right technology, a pro technology that we can reduce, particularly reduce the, the cost of disposal of the slush. So this can be done through technology they call crystallization process. Um, so this crystallization process will create a byproduct where the byproducts where we can uh, recycle. Sometimes we can recycle and also uh, can reduce the disposal cost. Uh, if, uh, if you can see here, recently there are many news about the, the uh, river, river pollution um, and contamination due to heavy metals. <coughs> and, uh, such as uh, contamination in in, uh, in uh, water pollution in Penang. You can see the chip come out from the untreated chip, uh, discharge from the landfills, and also uh, solvents, heavy metals, and sometimes cyanide also. So uh, heavy metals such as zinc and cyanide are colorless, and it's, it's, it's no smell, and it's di very difficult uh, forced to detect. Uh, here, the uh, uh, typical emitter uh, is uh, present in the wastewater and their source. If you look at this table, the uh, let's plumbum normally generated from the uh, batteries or from the pigments from the uh, glasses and plastic stabilizer. Essenics from 
electronic and glass production industry, copper from electronic and cable industry, zinc, yeah, a lot of zinc containing wastewater in Malaysia, particularly in the rubber, rubber industry, chromium from steel, pulp and mill and tanneries, cadmium as well, and mercury, also. and also nickel from stainless steel and nickel, uh, nickel plating industry. So um, if you look how this thing currently, this how uh, the common process that we that we use to handle this is water is using a standard uh, called a physical chemical process uh, to to remove heavy metals. So this method require a significant amount of chemical and also produce large amount of slashes. Uh, we, and uh, this slash need to, to be sent, I mean, to the to quality alarm for this for safe disposal. If you look at this diagram, uh, normally the wastewater from the factory is is stored yeah, first is 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 sent to the equipment uh, tank and then is pumped to the so called re reaction tanks to initiate the chemical reaction and further is is a uh, uh, coagulant uh, coagulants and flocculant is added to speed up the settling process, then you go to the clarifier or sedimentation tank to separate this source water, and then it produce a watery slush, I mean the byproducts. So this slush normally have high moisture content. Even after dewatering, the slush content, the slush, uh, the moisture content is slush still high in the range of 50 to 70%. And we look normally you have got huge, I mean larger, footprint. So um, this slush is categorized as uh, a, a code is a SW204. Uh, it's containing uh, inorganic constituent and contain metal and organic materials. So this one need to be sent to quantum. So just imagine the slush have water content about 70%. We just we just pay for water, not for the for heavy metals. And alternatively in Syria we have developed innovative solution to overcome this problem. So unlike the, the, the previous technology, uh, this we call crystallization process. Huh? This, this process does not produce a slush. Okay? It produces pure granules of metal carbonate, metal carbonates or sulfide, depend. Uh, so, but uh, the, the this process uh, is depend on complexity of water. Sometimes this granule can be recycled back directly to the factory, or we can uh, uh, dispose it. Eh? It depend complexity of the wastewater. Some wastewater contain many many kind of 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 constituents such as chromium, cyanide. It's mixed together, so it's very difficult to recycle back. But for single component, it's very easy to do that. So uh, the principle is is that is uh, the wastewater. Uh, this is the features. Eh? So the, the wastewater is pumped at the bottom, and um, this uh, we add seeding material inside the, the columns, and the waste um, this seeding material will be in suspension form. Coagulant reaction will take place, and this precipitate will coated into the surface of media of the seeding material, and this how the this crystallization process is, is initiated. Then, this um, the heavy uh, once once the the the, the granule size grow to one to two m mm, mm in diameter, the heavier part will be settled down, and when can we can remove it out from the uh, on the uh, on the reactor. So this slide this show our first of its kind. Of treatment plant that we installed in chromium factory. So this process quite this uh, at this site is very challenging because the heavy uh, the chromium the heavy metals the chromium plus concentration is about one thousand ppm, and the discharge standard is less than zero point zero five. So we need to combine many processes to get this one. So um, uh, and the interesting part is that. The slush that we produce, the moisture content just less than five percent, so very low. So, if we compare 
uh, we doing two process in, in, in next slide. Okay, in conventional process, we have um, we look into the byproduct composition, mostly content water, seventy percent, as compared to the crystal process where only five percent moisture. So the rest is heavy metal. So we look to this uh, slide. So the in conventional process, the you need very large footprints and high cost, uh, very costly to dispose because you no, know, we just uh, high water content and the product non recyclable cannot be recycled and have to go for the probably go through the special waste management. Some can be recycled back. Okay. And uh, you look into the into the advanced process question process is a single one column, a small footprint, and uh, very less water, and it can be recycled. And uh, so let's look into the case study. This is uh, we have done the study by taking sample from the rubber factory. We do I say our lab and we do a simulation in our lab. So in in some uh, acid latex with water from rubber industry. Normally, they have a lot of zinc. The zinc concentration can be from the range from 350 to 1,500 ppm. So, in average, it's about 800 milligram per liter. And the, the huge, the process use a lot of water. In average, about 500 km per day. And uh, if you look into the whole, you compare the process uh, with the conventional and crystal process, you see, uh, um, normally for the commercial process, Moisture is about 65%. And we look the pot the recovered zinc, zinc sulfide or the slush. And in a day, about 1.7 ton, as compared to crystal process, about less than half of that. So per year, uh, total slush generated per year about 520 ton, and crystal process about 160 ton. So if you we add in all the cost, because for zinc, roughly the cost about 700 ton. Per, per uh, 700 ringgit per ton to be disposed. And also, the, we add also the logistic cost, total about 780. So, we all in, uh, together, the disposal cost about 400,000 400, as compared to crystal process about 100. So, they are saving there, saving a year about 250k for this uh, size of, of factory. Uh, so, the capex, so for the, for the uh, crystal process, the capex. It depends on the nature of wastewater. It can be same or slightly higher, uh, of the for the for the capex and opec. It more or less is same. So, this vector actually concept can be applied to many industry, electro printings, electronics, and also even it can use to recover precious metal. So, in in, in acidic wastewater, even for water water treatment system, uh, water softening to remove hardness calcium, magnesium, and also can recover phosphate or I mean uh, the fertilizer, phosphate from sewage or from any sewage phosphate, and also from the uh, semiconductor, uh, okay, for right water. And, um, uh, okay, another three minutes, Cik Asma. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, I'm almost finished. Okay, uh, this, we can repurpose the existing plan by doing retrofitting or process optimization and the price the cost is about depend on the size roughly depend on the size about can be 200,000 onwards so this is uh, uh, our our plans maybe our first first kind of plan we built this time so i think uh, that is all about my presentation um me so thank you very much if you need more information you can contact me at this email or you can, can, can WhatsApp me. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Welcome. Thank you, T.S. Asha, for the uh, informative and interesting presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we move on? Up next, may I now invite T.S. Hassan Ismaila, Senior Executive of Industrial Center of Innovation for BioNG, to deliver his presentation. Please welcome T.S. Hassan. Well, let me start. I started my first day, or to be precise, my first morning at Sirim by climbing on the back of a lorry and start using a submersible pump.
to transfer audio chemical waste water into a raw water tank as feedstock for our USB and fixed bed anaerobic reactors. Each of them has a capacity of 100 liters. I am delightful to announce that as of today, I have spent almost half my lifetime or 24 years, 3 months and 14 days with Sirim. Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. On behalf of IC BioNG, I, Hassan Ismaila, would like to share with you our experience and maybe some knowledge during our involvement in the development of wastewater, biogas and biomethane projects. As uh, we are growing older, I mean by age, we have pledged that from today onwards, we aim to disseminate and pass down as much as possible our almost 100 years combined experience and knowledge to the next generation. Let's start with a 90 second video presentation. Ketibaan yang amat berhormat Ketua Menteri Sarawak Kasih sayang Terlalu indah untuk dikenang Selamanya yang telah terlibat dalam menjayakan projek pembangunan lojen di sini khususnya kepada pihak Sirim Berhad selalu rolling proses yang nak tahu kedat ni merawatkan sisa sagu mak dan mak sedapnya mesti terbang ke pungkir mak dapat nada kena pertama di dunia simpul di Malaysia dunia pertama Okay, the video you just saw is a is a for project in Muka Sarawak, a project which is a living example how we transfer our knowledge to the next generation, a committed generation from Kuching Sarawak. We are happy to know that now that they are not only the expert in sagu wastewater treatment but also the best that we have in the country, the AD or anaerobic digester is a self sufficient system and able to produce excess biogas equivalent to about 5000 liters of diesel a day with a simple payback we reckon less than 5 years and i cannot reveal more since the video itself is self explanatory our design principle while delivering solution for solid waste or waste water problem are simple better and cheaper solution for a complex problem. Let's try a very simple example. The final discharge from a biological treatment system of industry A exceeded the allowable COD limit. Our approach is to find the root cause of the problem by conducting a comprehensive mass balance and wastewater characteristic study. One that is more thorough than the ordinary IECS. We opt for this since we know that the problem could only be due to color or recalcitrant organics, soluble microbial product, or simply because of the TSS. There were cases where non-compliant discharge can be easily treated to meet the compliant standard using physical treatment only by means of filtering the discharge. It's cheap, simple, and you can forget about the AOP. How do we know this? We use our knowledge on the basic biochemical composition of wastewater which are carbo, protein and lipid. In most cases for ordinary wastewater, the TSS value should not exceed the COD value. For example, the minimum stoichiometric ratio 
shall not go lower than 1.07 unit COD per unit kabo. For lipid, say for palmitic or C16, the limit is 2.875. While protein, depending on its type, will sit in between carbo and the lipid values. For biogas and biomethane, again, we will start with biochemical composition analysis, comprehensive mass balance, and finally, we will run BMP test to determine the biokinetic parameters that we will use in our design calculation. These uh, biokinetic parameters and biogas quality from the BMP test as well as from the theoretical value obtained from stoichiometric calculation using biochemical composition will provide us the design value for the digester, biogas dome, piping sizes, fan chillers, flares, H2S scrubber, genset, etc. Lessons learned. Please do this before you bid for FIT or else you will struggle to make the quick profit if your net power for export to the grid is much lower than the DAA awarded to you by SEDA. The same goes to biomethane production. We have seen this situation so many times. This experience and coupled with our full understanding in wastewater, biogas and biomethane have develop our capacity to provide third-party verification and validation to related project process and product. Our previous and current client, for example, are Kulim Berhad, KGEV, Felda Waters and uh, Swing Water, uh, which also previously known as uh, Ebara Environmental. While it is a goal of CIRIM to offer its support for all industry in Malaysia, we reckon that project funders, project developer, clients, contractors and industries currently facing problems with the wastewater or waste are the parties that will be benefited the most from IC BioNG tech sharing and technical services. For funder, a funding proposal submitted to you might contain all the numbers that look promising on paper with an acceptable payback period. However, in real life, the reality could be different. For example, we have seen a feasibility study report which used specific methane conversion yield of 0.35 normal cubic meter methane per kg COD removed at 39 degrees Celsius. Normal cubic meter refers to condition at uh, 0 degree Celsius and pressure at 1 bar while the ordinary 1.5 mm HDPE dome pressure is negligible since it requires only less than 0.3 m bar to be fully inflated or max at uh, 0.5 m bar for aesthetic reason. Bankers, don't worry with the jargon. The easy explanation is the methane production was overestimated by 14%. That is just one variable and it's already accounted for 14%. There are several other variables contributed to the final yield and just imagine the resulting value if all the factors are compounded. Don't worry. Please do not rate them as high risk yet. We are still here and available to provide you the peace of mind you need knowing that CIRIM is readily available to come to the table as an independent third party to assist you to determine the level of risk possessed by a project so that you can make the difficult investment decision. Or perhaps let us review some sample of your already approved funding. Depending on the outcome, you may still have the time to do something. On the other hand, for a future successful project developer, you may have been awarded a project and you are given a certain time period to kick off the project and you might need the working capital. You approach a funder, but luckily or perhaps unfortunately, the funder was one of the attendees for our webinar today. So they started asking you so many technical questions and they asked you to furnish them with all the information for your application to be considered. Not yet approved, yeah? Don't worry. Let the solution come from the same source of the problem. Contact us 
and we will provide you the remedy of course for a small fees assuming everything goes well between the developer and the funder now we have the last party to worry about it is the big boss or the client you the developer have completed the job and need your final payment asap maybe the factor will chase the pay the final payment if you do factory the client answered back to you or the factor that they need a proof or a written proof that you have fulfilled your contractual obligation and guarantees are stated in the contract document luckily again the client was also one of our webinar attendees long story short and again not to worry contact us we will pro protect the interest for both of you finally to those industry having problems with your overloaded wastewater treatment plant or you may have a warehouse already fully occupied with barrels of wastewater to be treated since your daily wastewater volume is not that much so you keep it but the doe has been knocking on your door okay what to do please don't throw it to the river we have encountered enough water disruption problem in Lango. As our fellow funder, developer and big boss will do after this, you should follow suit. We try our best to provide you the best and the cheapest solution. And if there is none available, we will develop one especially for you. Just don't forget the small fees for us. Okay, first and foremost, we are an independent party who will take care of the interests of both parties. For example, the service provider and its intended recipient. If it is good, we'll say good. If On the other hand, if it is lemon, we'll say lemon. Our vast experience of working with various uh, types of solid waste and wastewater make us craving for new challenges for a more complex and recalcitrant waste. Our long journey has provided us with so many lessons learned to be implemented or not to be repeated to promote the recurrences of desirable outcome and at the same time to avoid undesirable outcome in similar project. At the same time, this has made us good when it comes to identifying risk associated with a particular project. We are ready to accept challenges for new type of wastewater other service provider will try to avoid since we have i wouldn't say second to none but uh, well equipped laboratories which can handle pretty much anything related to waste and wastewater wet chemistry and biological analysis for new process we also have several test benches for the development works our affiliated lab we share the same building uh, with us it's an ISO 17025 accredited lab and some of us were previously competent. This gives us the ability to spot any abnormality in a test report by just a glimpse on it. To prevent us from, from doing mistakes, we check, check and check our data before releasing our work to be scrutinized by an external reviewer with technical credential in that matter of interest. Finally, rest assured your information is safe with us and we will contain the data within the parameter of CIRIM complex. If necessary, we can also arrange to print your report using CIRIM security papers. Okay, these are short bio of my directors and myself. He did his bachelor degree in Japan while I obtained my master from Oakland Uni and Zach. But something just doesn't add up here. We did mention about a hundred years combined experience, right? And it's only 50 years uh, from both of us. Again, don't worry, rest assured, because there are many more of us behind the screen to support your endeavor. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we hope that all of you have acquired uh, the knowledge uh, from presentation delivered in depth. Uh, okay, uh, uh, gentlemen, 
we have uh, complete our first session this morning. So uh, can you hear me? Right? Can you hear? Okay. So uh, we will uh, we will start our next session, right? So at eleven fifteen, is that right? Eleven fifteen, we will start our next session. And please uh, come back for our next session because we will have uh, from IPASA, uh, University of Technology Malaysia, Professor Dr. Zainura Zainun. Okay, uh, with then uh, I will uh, we will end our session here, and I'll see you in the next session in uh, uh, ten minutes. Okay.